my name is Adam William Swap. My first name is spelled with two D's, my middle name with two L's, and my last name with two P's. <laughs> okay. Very good. Uh, I give my permission to uh, use this in any way you see fit, namely to bring glory to God. Amen. All right. Uh, I was born in 1961 in Salt Lake and uh, born to Mormon parents and uh, raised uh, right in the middle of Mormonism. You're raised in a traditional mainstream Mormon family? We, we lived on the avenues in mm -hmm. Salt Lake, okay. one of the oldest neighborhoods in Salt Lake. And the house that we lived in, we found out that it was a polygamous home. Oh, yeah and the house next door uh i guess the back in the early 1900s or late 1800s the uh guy had two wives in both houses um, we were mainstream mormon and i remember it was a time of turmoil in the 60s and the early 70s. It was a time of uh, a lot of uh, the hippie movement and people uh, asking questions. And <clears throat> I remember there was some kind of a march uh, that went on downtown, something to do with the blacks in the uh, Mormon church. And, and I remember my dad, he's, uh, He's educated, he's a teacher, and uh, quite well read, and he, uh, he started researching and studying, and he saw that the church before 1890 and the church after, the Mormon church, they were two different churches, and he had books and things on it, and and I remember as a kid, there was always kind of a question. I didn't really know anything. We, we lived in Salt Lake. I was still quite young. And uh, I remember that uh, one of the big things was is that in the Mormon church, it's, uh, it's an end times church. And, you know, in Christianity, that's the same. We do believe Christ is coming back, but the focus is on being prepared, you know, food storage, uh, um, how to survive. Um, and one of the prayers in our family was, was that we could move out of the city. And uh, I remember that uh, we would always pray, family, family prayer, Lord, please find us a little farm out in the country. And uh, I remember dad always asking us kids who wants to milk the cow, you know, who wants to gather the eggs and who wants to raise the garden. Well, we never thought it would happen. It was for years we prayed that. And when I was 12, uh, we finally, I was gonna go to Bryant Junior High and I remember mom and dad seeing that a bunch of kids had been busted for sniffing glue. And they said, we don't want our kids doing that. So. They found a place down in St. Pete County, beautiful little place, Fairview. And uh, we moved down and uh, it, was, it was wonderful. It was a great move. And and how old were you when this happened? 12 years old. Okay. So you were all on board with that? Oh yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was a great move. and Really enjoyed it down there. We still live down there. But uh, I remember growing up uh, all of the tokens of Mormonism, uh, we, that's all I knew. Uh, we would ride our bikes up at uh, the city cemetery up uh, by Lindsay Gardens, and we would look for the old uh, famous Mormon headstones, and uh, we would go to Temple Square, and we'd look at the temple and we'd, we'd see all the signs and symbols, the phases of the moon, the five-pointed stars, the hand shaking, the all-seeing eye, the spires, and everything meant something. And always a mystery, always, uh, uh, always very intriguing. Um, we went to the, the 
the North 21st Ward, which was the uh, one of the oldest wards in the city. And they had- That when you were in Salt Lake. That was when we were in Salt Lake, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm going back to Salt Lake. Um, they tore that building down. And I happened to turn eight years old when they did. And because of that, I got baptized in the basement of uh, the Tabernacle building. They actually have a font there. Um, I always thought that was a pretty big deal, but uh, um, Brigham Young's house, the Beehive house, that was, we, we toured that a number of times. That was uh, part of our history. I have a couple of distant great, great aunts that married Brigham Young in St. George, and uh, he was an integral part of our history. Um, I do remember in there, uh, particularly, he had a desk that had all these cubby holes. And the reason that means something to me is because Brigham Young had made a, one of his discourses that I'd read years later was that if you have a question about anything, roll it up and pigeonhole it. And in my mind, I always would roll it up and I'd pigeonhole it in his desk. And after a while, that desk got pretty full. But that was my visual when you had a problem with, you know, uh, how does the Adam God doctrine work? How does, you know, uh, all of these different things work? I would always pigeonhole it and, and put it in that imaginary desk. But now, were these conflicts between what former Mormonism had taught and what the current church was teaching? That right. See, now, I, I was um, raised in the modern day church. Right. And one of the things in our home was Mormonism was all truth, okay? Mormonism wasn't interpreted truth. Mormonism was all truth. That's what we were told. It's truth. If it's truth, it's Mormonism. And so we were always in a hunt for the truth. And the idea of questioning Mormonism as truth, that wasn't really the issue. It was what is true in Mormonism? And one of the doctrines of Mormonism is that the church, the early first century church, um, it fell away. They had a priesthood and they couldn't pass it on because of wickedness. So it stopped, that, that apostolic succession stopped. Um, so what happened in, in Mormonism is Joseph Smith restored it. Now, if Joseph Smith restored this authority, priesthood authority, then it stands to reason that if God doesn't change and his word is eternal, if he gives a, a word to a prophet, say Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or John Taylor, then that's the word of God. If another prophet comes along and he contradicts what that former prophet said, then by logic, it doesn't add up, so the succession then stops again as it did in the first century. That's, that was my sense of it. So either, either that whole thing was wrong, which wasn't an issue at the time, or the latter day prophets weren't really prophets. And so... Now, is this something that you as a family were, were coming to? No, or no. Is it is not some. That's my mom and dad and my brothers and sisters. Sister is uh, there. They're on their own journey. And um, most of my brothers are still in the church. And But my journey went to where... Um, I studied, and I, I was going to the University of Utah, and I spent more time studying the old Mormon doctrines, uh, Journal of Discourses, and I had a number of uh, fundamentalist books by Ogden Kraut, Norman C. Pierce, uh, B. Harvey Allred, and it just plainly spelled it out. If uh, these, these men who were prophets uh, spoke of the Adam-God doctrine, of 
plural marriage being the eternal celestial marriage. Celestial marriage was plural marriage. It wasn't just being married in a temple, it was actually plural marriage. And so it was like if, if these are the doctrines, um, where do I stand? And one of the uh, sections in the Doctrine and Covenants speaks about a setting in order. That there will be one mighty and strong who comes and sets the church of house, uh, the house of God in order. And so that started to make sense. Okay, well, if it's going to be set in order, then it must have been out of order. And if it's out of order, then where do I stand? So I sought the old covenants, the old teachings. And I, uh, it was quite a journey. I was always taught that uh, there were two churches and you either belong to the Church of God or you belong to the Church of the Devil. And that speaks of in the Book of Mormon and it just generally makes sense. And that was where I wanted to belong. I wanted to belong to the Church of God and whatever it took to do that, that's what I wanted. Um, uh, I was always taught to pray. Um, prayer was uh, a big thing in our family. We, we always had family prayer and always prayed by my bed when I woke up and when I went to bed and whenever we went on a trip as a family we'd always pray. And, um, I think that that single element is one of the things that God really used to work in my life. Because uh, um, I always prayed, and uh, God always heard my prayers. He always worked with me, even in my deepest uh, ignorance. But, oh, Enzyme Peak, that was another thing. And uh, Enzyme Peak, we used to go up there and fly kites as kids. There weren't houses up there and stuff. And we knew the story of Brigham Young flying a flag different than the Mer American flag called the flag of the kingdom of God. And that always intrigued me, the flag of the kingdom of God. Um, I never really knew what it was. I knew that he had flown it up there and that was very interesting to me. And years later, I saw that uh, John Singer had that flag draped over his coffin after he died, which was an element that really uh, spoke in me. I had an incident. I had an incident when I was a kid. We were coming out of uh, we were coming out of the 21st North Ward. Mm -hmm. I was just a little kid, and I jumped into the street and almost got hit. And I remember my dad saying, "Boy, do you want to get killed?" And I didn't know what he meant. I was just a little kid. It, this really sticks in my head. And I remember mom saying, you, you don't know what death is? And I said, no, death. It was the first time that I'd ever thought of death. And she said, uh, well, Adam, everybody dies. They eventually die. And I said, what do you mean die? And she says, you leave your body here and they bury it. And then you go on either to heaven or hell or wherever. <clears throat> and I was like, so I'm going to die. And she said, yeah. And I says, well, where do I go after I die? And she said, well, if you do good and you work hard and you live the commandments, you can go to heaven. And that always stuck with me. The working, the earning my way to heaven. And that is that's the foundation of Mormonism. You do it through your own works, through your own righteousness, your own self-righteousness, your own efforts. You've got to get the covenants and the keys and the priesthood and the ordinances, and you've got to work to do it. And that was something I found out years later that I couldn't do it. And no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't do it.
wow, I found out the grace of God is so amazing. I never knew what it was. <laughs> never knew what grace was. Um, there was an incident that I had. There was an incident that I had when I was in junior high. We had moved down to Fairview. And a friend of mine, his name was Stephen, he told me at, at school, he says, I've got something I want to tell you. And I says, well, what is it? And he says, I can't tell you. And I says, well, then why did you tell me? <laughs> and I said, I chased him around the school all day. He really intrigued me. No, my dad swore, swore me to secrecy that I couldn't tell. And I said, Stephen, you got to tell me. And I remember at the end of the day, we had to ride a bus from Moroni to Mount Pleasant and Fairview. I grabbed hold of him, I threw him up against the bus, and I said, Stephen, tell me. And he said, uh, oh, you can't tell anyone. He said, my dad told me that Adam is our God. And I said, what? Adam is our God? It just, I couldn't even understand what he was talking about. He says, yeah, I can't, and he would not tell me anymore. That was it. So I got home, and dad got home from work. I asked mom, she knew nothing about it. And I asked dad, and dad said, I don't know. And I remember him and mom going in the other room and talking about it. And they came out and they said, we can't tell you. Now that's the worst thing yeah. that you can tell a kid, we can't tell you. So what's your credit? <laughs> I says, dad, what's this about investigating all truth? I mean, we had books on everything We from, uh, flying saucers to uh, esoteric knowledge, uh, hollow earth, uh, Bigfoot, you name it. We're, there were no questions that we couldn't ask in our home. And when he says, I can't tell you, I was like, are you serious? And I finally, I says, Dad, you got to tell me. And he says, look, I'll let you read it for yourself. Whatever you do with it, it's your business. And I'll never forget, he got out the Journal of Discourses, Volume 1, page 50. And Brigham Young said, he is the only God with whom we have to do. And that was a big deal. And I remember asking it at church. And the fact the guy I asked had no idea even what I was talking about. But that was a milestone in my uh, journey. Just a quick aside, though, on the whole Adam God. One thing, I, I mean, I didn't grow up in Mormonism, and so um, I, I could never understand why that was such a game changer. Well, I mean, in, I mean, I know it's blasphemous and all, in, but I mean, in terms of how it... In Mormonism, uh -huh. okay, Mormonism is kind of your, your backwoods, handle every situation, um, your American individualism, and we want to understand everything, and we want uh, anything that's a mystery, we want it explained away. And at first blush, pretty much explains it. Wow, okay, I'm a man, I'm created in the image of God, um, I guess I'm going to become a God. And it seems pretty simple, but then once you get, you delve deeper into it, and of course, coming from a background that the Bible is very questionable anyhow, uh, you question everything. You question everything to the point that there's really nothing that's not untouchable, like who God is. And that was something I found out years later. But, uh, yeah, it's a game changer in the sense that the modern day church doesn't teach it, but they do in a, in a way. You know, they, they want to they, they wanna do both sides of the coin. They want to say, you know, God is our eternal Father. And but if you really get questioning, eternal for this earth, or I'm not really sure how it works. Um, one of the things that's, that's happened to me is uh, since my born again experience, my old self, I can hardly, it's hard for me to, to find it. So you want me to tell my story and I look back, and it's like, wow, I really did all that. Telling a story of somebody else. Huh? It is. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, uh, that's not me, not anymore, but. Well, he said he makes us a new creation. He does, and he did. And boy, do I love him. <laughs> I'm so thankful for him. So, uh, another episode that happened, another episode that I remember in my journey. I was uh, Wasatch Elementary in the avenues in the 60s, early 70s in elementary. I was the only boy, the only boy that had short hair. And not just short hair, but a nice shaved uh, missionary haircut. And I had to stand up to that. That was, uh, you know, most of the boys had the hippie long hair. And uh, in our family, hippies were wrong. Hippies were bad. Uh, hippies were rebellious and so that was the atmosphere I came from. That's, uh, that was in our family. And after we moved to Fairview, um, a couple of years, I was probably 14. Uh, my dad says, uh, wanted to take me with him to meet some friends that he had. And this uh, was in Manti. And I asked him, where are we going, Dad? And he says, we're going to go meet some guys that are selling food storage. And he says, they're good friends of mine. And uh, I said, OK. We went down there. Uh, they had a semi, and they were selling uh, wheat and beans and stuff out of the back of the semi. And we stopped the car, and, and Dad looked over at me. He said, now, you remember everything I said to you about hippies? And I said, yeah, I remember. I mean, how couldn't I? That was, you know, I had a bunch of brothers that come up and when we fought, we'd call each other hippies, you know. So, uh, cause that was, that was bad. Insult, yeah. <laughs> he says, well, these two guys are, they're hippies. He says that they're not really hippies, but they were hippies. Uh, they got long hair, they got beards. He says, but they're my friends. And he said, they're good guys. So, wow, I, that would just kind of blew me away. And he said one other thing. He said, they're uh, fundamentalists. They have more than one wife. And you could have knocked me over with a feather. I, it's like, w wow. Um, so I met these two guys, and I, they very decent people. Um, Ernest has long since died, but uh, they were Ernest and Gordon were their names. He ran, he ran Grandpa's bookstore in Provo. And any fundamentalist from the 70s would know who he was. Um, very decent person, uh, good character. Um, and Gordon, he ran uh, a food storage place in Provo called uh, Zion's. And uh, he's still alive and uh, I know him fairly well. It's been years since I've really talked to him, but uh, a very decent person. Long since cut his hair. Um, that was just one of the, anything was possible in yeah. my journey. And that was something that kind of stuck out in my life that I wanted to share. I guess I'll talk about uh, conspiracies and uh, secret combinations. That was a big deal in, in uh, if you'll read Joseph Smith's inspired version of the Bible, I believe it's in there. He talks about a pact that was made between Satan and Cain. And Cain was called Master Mahon. And he actually had authority over uh, Satan because he had a body. And 
he is in charge of all the conspiracies and the secret combinations. Now, you can read about that in the Book of Mormon as well. Book of Mormon is full of priestcrafts and secret combinations. And so basically in Mormonism, that's what happened to the first century church is that the secret combinations corrupted the Bible and destroyed the priesthood. And um, that was something that was also happening in the government. It was happening in all society. And it's basically, um, even in the modern day Mormon church, uh, there is a preponderance, preponderance, is that the right word, of an overriding uh, emphasis mm -hmm. on conspiracies. Um, and it was one way that you could um, reason away or justify away things like everybody knows that all of those cities in Yucatan, in Mexico, in uh, you know the the, the uh, Aztecs and the uh, Incas that the, that's all Book of Mormon and it's older and the conspiracies are hiding it, suppressing it. So if you'll look in the older Book of Mormons, you will see the you know Quetzalcoatl's temple and and all of the different you know uh, ruins down there and. Some of them actually say uh, Lamanite and Nephite cities. Some of them, they just leave them there and let you draw your conclusion. Oh, okay, so they're hiding the, the, the real truth. Um, and it, it's something that upon deeper investigation, if you was to really investigate it, it would just fall flat on its face. I mean, there is no BYU professor who deals in archaeology that has ever said that anything down there is remotely Nephite or Lamanite. They found nothing, not a coin, not a sword, not a breastplate, not uh, any type of writing. No writing has ever been discovered that's called Reformed Egyptian or in close to it. But you could use the conspiracies to say, well, they're hiding the truth. Uh, another thing about the Book of Mormon is, is that God made it that way yeah. so that you had to accept it by faith. Um, once I started partaking of the Bible and believing it fully, uh, yeah, it spoke, it spoke life. It is truth, but there is also so much evidence that backs it in every, every aspect in arch archeological, um, you know, it's, so you don't have to just accept it by blind faith. In Mormonism, I get the impression that there's almost something noble about believing something in spite of a lack of evidence or even evidence to the contrary. Um, there is there is a like well, that's real faith because it doesn't require evidence to to back it up. Right. No. Yeah. That you do have a point there. There is something um, when you see. I never questioned the idea that. Um, my heart and my feelings confirmed truth. That was, well, of course. Oh, the Spirit told me. Well, of course, and you, would, you never thought any further of that. But when you start reading the Bible, and the Bible tells us about our heart, that it is corrupt and possibly wicked, and that it's a man who trusts in his heart is a fool, in Proverbs, um, yeah, you. It's a whole new aspect. It's like grace. You, you, you've never heard that before. Well, what do you mean? I can't trust my heart. What do you? Well, in Mormonism, you are always looking for a feeling, a burning in the bosom, a revelation, uh, open vision, a dream, um, a sign. Um, I got a sign. Uh, finding something, a, a seer stone. Uh, always wanting a manifestation that didn't have any basis in the Word of God or it, it was just 
and you could come up with some pretty fantastic stuff. And that's, that's what happened in Mormonism. When Joseph divorced his beliefs from the Word of God, when he brought in the eighth article of faith and said, we believe the Word of God, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it's translated correctly, it gave me all kinds of wiggle room. Um, so, that was my, I don't know if I talked about that, wanting the highest degree of the celestial kingdom. Um, that was my drive. That's what I wanted. I wanted to obtain into the highest degree of the celestial kingdom. And I formed a prayer that I prayed all the time. Dear God, this is after I got married, Dear God, take me on a course through my life whereby you will bring me and my family into the highest degree of the celestial kingdom, no matter how hard it is. And that took me quite a number of years to finally God brought me to the point to where I was in a in a jail cell crying out to God for help and asking Him to forgive me of that prayer. Where He, uh, I cried and said, I'm a sinner and I need Your grace. Because I'd just been reading about grace. I was thinking, wow, I love this. That's all I have to do is believe. And uh, anyhow, that, that was the impetus behind my life up to the point. Um, I guess I better get into... Yeah, in a way, he got him answered that prayer anyway. I mean, he has brought you yes. on a path that is he did. the highest... He did. You know, that, see, yeah. and that was the thing, too, in... in uh, in Mormonism, see, you have to realize, I, I didn't meet a born-again Christian till I was probably in prison. I mean, I may have met people, but they never witnessed or testified yeah, to yeah. me. And I had all the truth. Why do I need anything else? I was born in uh, the capital of Mormonism, Salt Lake City. I had my dad gave me the priesthood. I could trace it three steps back to Joseph Smith. Um, I was pretty proud of that. Um, I was born on April 6th, which was uh, the birth date, they say, of Jesus Christ and the founding of the Mormon Church. And all of these things, these were nails that, that kept me right there on the path of Mormonism. And. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, when you prayed that uh, God would bring you and your family to the highest level of the celestial kingdom, you realized that would include polygamy at that time? Absolutely. That, that's what, Yes, after I got married, that was, polygamy was an essential. And because it was, the, the point is, is that if God is eternal, and when he speaks, he doesn't vary to the right or left. Um, when he instituted it through Joseph Smith, when you come from that premise um, and you fully believe Joseph Smith is a prophet, um, in the fundamentalist belief, you, you believe that everything before 1890 is the only thing you can trust. And everything after that is the great compromise. And that compromise uh, is part of the reason that God's going to set the house of God in order and bring one mighty and strong to set it back in order. So to live true to the teachings, you'd have to go to the doctrines that were before 1890. And yeah, part of that prayer of obtaining unto the highest was getting my ordinances, my covenants, washings and anointings, um, wearing the priesthood garment, and uh, marrying in the new and everlasting covenant, which was plural marriage. When I was about 18, seven, probably 17, I saw on television a man, um, John Singer, and uh, he'd taken his children out of public school, 
and it really intrigued me. Uh, so much so that I was in the process of going up to see him. And found out through the news that he'd been killed. And uh, it was a pretty big deal where I was at. Uh, big talk, a lot of news media coverage. Um, he had been under siege on his place up in Marion, Utah for 13 months. And he had taken his children out of public school, was teaching them himself. He had his own, built his own schoolhouse on his property. And uh, he had taken another wife, which caused a lot of controversy. And it ended up he uh, had went to his mailbox and they killed him, shot him. Who? Uh, the law enforcement. They were trying to get him. Um, he was guilty of a Class A misdemeanor, but then he resisted arrest about midterm of that 13 months, and then they put a felony warrant on him. And uh, anyhow, that so you was. I hadn't met him. No, I'd never met him, no. Okay. Um, I'd listened a lot about him on talk radio. Back then, talk radio was a pretty big deal. And uh, also seen him on television. And, I was, shortly after that, I went to, let's see, when he was killed in January of 79, I was in the middle of uh, going to the University of Utah. And about, I think about 11, 12 months later, maybe 13 months later, I went up to the, to the place where he lived up in Marion and to meet his widow and his family. And, uh, It was just a further progression in, he was a fundamentalist, independent fundamentalist. And uh, one thing led to another and, and uh, 11, I believe 11 months after I met him, I married their oldest daughter. And uh, we started having, raising our family and uh, it uh, was part of my fundamentalist journey. And so by this time, had you uh, discontinued your association with the mainstream church, or were you still involved in the No, I, I had stopped going to the mainstream church probably when I was 18, mm -hmm. if not earlier than that. And it was because you were coming to the conclusion that they were... That they had... They'd lost the way. They had strayed from their earlier teachings, and uh, it was... Yeah, I was on a journey trying to find the truth. So I, uh, about that time there was, Jerry Spence came in, he's a trial lawyer out of uh, Wyoming, and he brought a lawsuit against the state of Utah and the Mormon church for a wrongful death on John Singer. And, uh, that was a pretty big deal. It uh, made the news and pretty much bolstered us in, in our beliefs. And um, Shortly thereafter, um, I married Heidi's sister. Heidi was my first wife. I married her sister, Charlotte. And uh, that was accompanied by dreams and revelations and uh, fully um, backed by the early Mormon doctrine. And this was something to further that prayer of obtaining unto the highest. Um, Brigham Young had made a statement that you do away with polygamy, you do away with the Mormon church, basically. Um, you can't separate the two. And if Brigham Young was a prophet, then that was the truth. If he wasn't a prophet, then nobody af after him was either. So, according to apostolic yeah. succession. <laughs> so, certain things in our family um, 
there's so much history here, and I'm trying to recall it. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a spirit of uh, us against them, and you know our neighbors. They we, we lived in the middle of a 180-acre farm of John's relatives. They were modern-day church. He had a little three-acre parcel right in the middle of their place and they didn't like us and they took our irrigation water and then they undermined our as actually the city of marion undermined our our head house to our spring and all of these things just emboldened and uh our feeling of being persecuted and us against the world and in reality you were being persecuted well I mean, yeah, there was a there was definitely an element of persecution. Um, whether or not we helped to bring that on or not, um, as I got reading later, when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. And I thought of that when I read that. Yeah, why don't we just leave? <laughs> but taking our water was a big deal, and. That was kind of the main catalyst that set me on a course to where I went down and blew up the Mormon church. Um, I'd went up, tried to take the water back. They had put up a head house above ours, a couple hundred feet above our head house where they had dug down to the strata and they'd taken the water and there was a certain strata of water and they got gravel and pipes and drained our head house by about 90%. And uh, I went up with the black ABS hose and I found a place where I could hook it into their system and I put it back into our head house and they took it and then they went up, I put, got another one and, oh. excuse me. And this, this is all happening up in the forest, okay. And so I was digging a trench and the sheriffs came up. They'd called the sheriffs. It's their property. I was taking back the water. Well, by this time I'd armed myself. And one of the, uh, one of the teachings of really of Brigham Young, Brigham Young mainly was you stood and you fought, you fought manfully you did not fear the faces of your enemies. And that proved your priesthood. If you could stand up and fight, it didn't matter what the odds were. Being humble and submissive and turning the other cheek and loving your enemies is Matthew 5, 44. Jesus. Right, that was, yeah, that wasn't an issue. It was, it was being manful, doing the right thing. That's what. So the sheriffs come up and, and I told them I wouldn't leave uh, until I had buried the pipe. And they didn't want a confrontation and they left. I buried the pipe and it was left alone for a while. Then they stopped it again. Somehow I can't remember how, but there was a, one of the people that I believed at the time had had a hand in killing John, uh, lived down on the main road, and this was Halloween time. And he had a display on his lawn of a car, there was a car parked on his lawn, and he put all these dummies, probably his kids did it, put all these dummies on the car as if the car had run into him. And it so disgusted me, I thought, here this guy had a hand in killing John, and he's got this display and I was so incensed about it and making this stand that I was making progressively. I went down that night and spray painted on his car that he had uh, killed John Singer. And at the same time, I went to two other houses, people that I felt at the time um, had a hand in killing John. And I really, I really provoked a fear in the valley there, which I'm really sorry that I did now, but 
It's just part of my story now. Uh, sometime later, they had they had scrubbed it off, and uh, anyhow, the next morning, I, we had a gate across our property. Not my property. I lived up there as my mother-in-law's property, and there was no trespassing signs. And the sheriffs came up. They knew who did it. Um, at this time, I had been writing letters to anybody and everybody I thought had a hand in John's death. Judges, lawyers, it didn't matter. If your name came up, I wrote you a letter, or I put your letter on one, it was, I think it was one big letter that I had a lot of names on. And I didn't threaten them personally, but I told them if they didn't repent, that they would, would suffer judgment, God's judgment, they'd go to hell. And so the sheriffs knew about me. And after the places were spray painted on, they came up. And uh, I says, don't, don't cross that fence. This is private property. I, st I was armed. Well, both of them come up over the fence. And uh, I shot over their heads. And that was really, that was the turning point. Uh, they left and uh, got warrants for my arrest. So, and that was in October, the very end of October. So, I didn't leave the property. Um, and they were trying to find a way to get me because I had assaulted uh, uh, officers. And uh, We had gotten uh, stuff from the sheriffs probably that summer, just before I had went down and spray painted on their homes. And just before I had run the sheriff's off at gunpoint, we'd received a box of stuff from the sheriff's department that they had in their possession from when John had been killed nine years earlier. We got his uh, blood-soaked garments, the long sleeve, long garments. And we had gotten his pistol we had gotten his uh, tapes that they had. I don't know why they had tapes of him. Uh, but this really was just like throwing gasoline on fire. Uh, and in my, my self-righteous indignation, uh, that w helped to embolden me to go forward and make a stand. And that's what it was coming to. I was going to make a stand. And uh, so between October and January, I basically was uh, just on the property. And you know, what year was that? That was uh, uh, 86, October of 80. No, October of 80s. October of 87 okay. to uh, January of 88, that's right. And I did a lot of fasting and praying. And in Mormonism, you fast for three days. And it was, uh, it was humbling, but it was also a badge of honor to say I fast without food or water for three days. And it was, it was a pride thing now that I look back on it but it was also part of how you did it. And I received revelation that I was to blow up the church. And to understand the mindset, it's difficult to explain it, but you have self-fulfilling uh, visions and dreams and any little thread that you can tie together and you build on this and it finally came to a head to where I got dynamite and ammonium nitrate and I watched the church because you can see it from our place it's through open fields about a mile I watched it at night to make sure no one went in it and uh I put together a bomb and uh, planted it and had it go off at 2 o'clock in the morning. 
and uh, a lot of stuff happened, you know, different things. We The whole, I'm not even going to really get into the siege, but there was a 13-day siege, and uh, it ended up uh, that uh, there was a shootout. Um, my brother-in-law was shooting at dogs that they had sent at me, and the bullets went through his door, and uh, I got shot, shot in the chest and the arm, and one of the bullets that was sent at the dogs killed an officer. And uh, I think this would be a good time. I just want to apologize to uh, the House family. I wished it had never happened. I wished I knew then what I know now. I uh, carry that burden on my heart. And uh, I carry you in my prayers. I'm sorry that it happened. Uh, Ann House, one of the reasons that I'm out is because she forgave me. And uh, I know it's been a big heavy burden for her to bear and her children. And uh, I just pray for them. Pray God would bless them. So uh, after that, uh, I got arrested and uh, I went to prison. Uh, 1988 went to through through two trials, uh, state and federal, and it was a very hard year in my life, one of the hardest. Uh, two jury trials, and we were found guilty of everything. We were guilty. I. Uh, Got a 30 years, basically. And I was shipped to a federal prison. And that was in Florida. Um, I've been in prisons all over the country. So I was in Florida. I was in uh, Inglewood, Colorado, uh, Sheridan, Oregon, uh, Memphis, Tennessee for a couple of years. Uh, then I was in Phoenix. And in my journey, I uh, I attribute uh, prison was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I'm here giving my testimony because God is good. He took me on a journey as I had prayed. To take me to the highest degree, the celestial kingdom. What a journey. All of the different prisons. That was God's air attack on this hardened soul. He, uh, I met people that would question me about my beliefs. And uh, Certain ones point stick out to me. I had a uh, Native American celly, and he, he asked me in his broken, right from the reservation, uh, Rosebud, they have a lot of uh, Native Americans. And uh, he says, so uh, why is the Book of Mormon uh, 
got the King James Version in it. And I said, I don't know. I just kind of wrote it off, pigeonholed it in that, mm -hmm. that desk. And I had another Sally said, uh, very, very innocently asked me, uh, do, do you have a, can I see a copy of uh, Reformed Egyptian? I says, anywhere, you know, have they found it anywhere? And I said, I have no idea what it looks like. I don't know. But uh, I got to meet all kinds of people. Uh, I got to meet a lot of good people who made mistakes. And there was quite a Christian presence in the prisons. And some of them were fake trying to do it for early release. I saw that. But there were some that were genuine, guys that were doing life, and they had embraced the Lord. And that's like, it was always attractive to me, but I was still stuck on my priesthood and my, you know, working. You know, I had, I had something none of them had. At least I thought I did. So I finished my Federal time, I was in Phoenix, the, at the joint there, uh, FCI, north of Phoenix, and I thought I was coming back to Utah. Well, they have an interstate compact where they have an agreement with the state of Arizona, and I was transferred to Arizona State Prison, and I was put in max. I had never gotten a write-up incident report of of any kind for 20 years. And they had, they had no logical reason to do it, but because they saw that I had the death of an officer, they put me in their max. And at that time, Warren Jeffs was in the news. And uh, our fundamentalism on our polygamy is night and day to theirs. We'd heard horror stories of people getting delivered, escaping from down there. Um, and I had nothing to do with that guy, but because they knew that I was a fundamentalist, it didn't matter. We were in the same basket. So I was attacked. Now, I was in maximum security, locked down. You didn't move without four officers. You would back up to the cell door, put your hands through the food slot, they'd cuff you, but where I was at, I'd borrowed a book from a neighbor, and they have a very close click. And uh, he grabbed hold of my arm, tried to break it. And subsequently, I was put in protective custody, uh, but not really, it wasn't really protective custody. It was in a different unit, but I, they'd moved me to get me away from those guys. But they were on the joint. And they had given me one sheet of paper while I was there. I kept asking, why am I here? And they gave me one sheet of paper that said that I had no parole, that I was going to do 15 years, and we're going to make sure you do it right here. Um, they put me in this cell the most vile, foul condition I've ever been in in my life. It had a hole next to the toilet where the sewer would back up. The floor was covered in feces, toilet paper, and it was old. This is an old prison. It's battleship gray, and it's the most oppressive. It's just evil. And there was a little tiny window. They controlled the light, and the bed looked like an autopsy had been performed on it. It was horrible. And God was breaking my spirit down. I was there three days. They moved me to another cell that wasn't, wasn't much better, but it was. And I just I kept praying, God help me. Um, I still held that prayer, take me on that journey. I had to that point. And finally, I'm, I found myself, my face on the floor of that cell, 
just crying out to God. And all I could say was, God, help me. Help me, help me. Help me, God. And I didn't see him. And it was probably the only true revelation I've ever had. But Jesus came to me in that cell. And he said, Adam, I want you to do two things. I want you to read the New Testament as if you've never read it before like a little child. And I want you to believe every single word of it. No qualifying every word of it. That was it. I thought, okay, wow, that's it. I got in the word and I started to believe every word of it. One of the first things that hit me was Matthew 5.44 turning good for evil. And I started reading. The first thing that really hit me was the behavior that God wants of His children. We're to be lambs. We're to be harmless. We're to be simple. We're never to return evil for evil. And it was like, wow, if this is true, if you want me to believe every single word of this, then I'm guilty. I'm guilty of a man's blood. And when I said that, it just... I couldn't handle it. It was, it was so overwhelming to me. I was in such a dark place. Here, the Lord told me to read this and believe it. And I was like, wow. I never had considered myself a murderer, guilty of a man's blood but I was. And uh, the next thing I found was that forgiveness is so simple. And I started reading about grace. And I didn't know what grace was. I didn't know. I'd never heard of this concept. All I have to do is believe in Jesus. I'd never heard this. That He did the works. It was so it was so out of my worldview, but it was so refreshing. And that was about six and a half years before I got out of prison. And uh, that's all I ever did was read. I was reading in the New Testament. And nobody taught me. Nobody taught me about grace. The Word taught me. God taught me through the Word. The Word. If you believe the Bible, Mormonism falls flat on its face. It doesn't stand. You don't work. Work is something that comes after. It is a result of. It proves that you are born again because you want to please your Lord because of what He did for us. That God Himself came down and paid the price for our sin. In the, the six plus years that I had left, I read that book 88 times. And uh, every single time was a, it was brand new. Still now, I mean, it's just alive. It is, it's just amazing. A lot of things in my journey, uh, I have to admit though, uh, I'm like the blind man in Mark. He said, uh, Jesus laid his hand on him twice. He says, first time he says, I see men as trees walking. And in a lot of my ways, I was like that. Well, I, I kind of see it, but I can't fully comprehend it. I don't really understand it. Um, different elements happened to me there too. Um, I had my wife send me some books. I, I had her send me a couple books on how the Bible was put together. and uh, I kept, when, when I was at that prison, I, I called two times in one year. That's all I could get to a phone. I was there 14 months 
uh, two weeks and one day, and I was transferred back to the federal prison in Phoenix. And Charlotte then moved down. Uh, my first wife left me right shortly after I went to prison, and uh, Charlotte stayed with me faithfully. She moved to Fairview in 1999, bought a home, and all the, she raised my kids. And uh, they left the home, and I had five years left. And she said, um, I'm not staying up here. So she moved down, became a, a health care worker for a lady, and she's got quite a, an experience of her own. And uh, we got to visit uh, seven times uh, in a month, uh, four Mondays, three Sundays. And those were the highlights. And uh, we really did a lot of footwork. I, we laughed at the first three months we'd had more visits than we'd had in the prior 20 years. <laughs> but I was always calling her there and saying, wow, you gotta get in the New Testament. You've gotta get in the New Testament. You gotta read. And, and I could tell she wasn't. You know, and then she'd say, "Yeah, I read a little." And okay, I, yeah, I did. So it's just to shut me up. And, but she got into it, and it caught her on fire. And she has her own story where God started working in her life. And, and uh, so I got released, and uh, I've just been learning more and more. And, I don't know that I have much more to tell. There's it, there's so much in depth stuff yeah, that, yeah. you know. I'm, How long did you, were you released? Um, it's been two years. Two years on the ninth. I got out on my youngest son's birthday, so that was. A, it's a great present. Yeah, I did. Uh, let's see what. Twenty five and a half over twenty five and a half years. So, so thirty years of you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the pro board looked quite favorable. I had never gotten a write up and. Uh, and with uh, Anne's uh, letter of recommendation, they, they released me. Well, what were some of the scriptures that were the most? The, I, I want to give you, I want to go through the scriptures sure. because yeah. that was the scriptures, the word, mm -hmm. that's more powerful than anything else. Because all the arguments, you know, I had an answer, or at least I thought I did. Yeah. And if I didn't have an answer, I had pride. The pride got me through it. Um, that's basically it, you know. And I had so much invested. Yeah. Investment is a, a great tool of the devil. Mm. You know, when you have five and six generations of Mormons behind you, all your family is Mormon, um, and then you've invested so much of your life in prison over your beliefs. Um, it took, it took the mighty hand of God. To when you really came to grips with the fact that you were guilty, guilty. legally guilty, right? Had you felt justified up until that point? Okay, don't get me wrong. Oh, uh -huh. um, I always maintained that I was guilty, uh -huh. um, but not wrong. Mm. Okay, I maintained that I did what I did, right, right. but that I was justified. Then there came a point after I was born again, okay? That's, there's no other explanation. God okay. gave me a new heart. And from that point on, I knew that I was guilty and that I was wrong, guilty. But also when I look back on my life, making that clean slate being perfect, working, doing all this, and ne you never could do it. Yeah. No matter how long you fasted, no matter how much you prayed, no matter how hard you tried, no matter how long you read in the Journal of Discourses or what, you couldn't do it. And you never, you never felt like you were there. Now I know in 1 John that I have eternal life. Now, when I'd read it before, um, Heaven, mm -hmm. you know, you'll be with me in heaven. Heaven was, okay, that's an okay thing in Mormonism. Yeah, yeah, everybody's going to be in heaven. It's salvation. It's a, it's, a, it's a menial thing. But 
when I came to believe fully the Bible, heaven, heaven is the greatest. That's where God is. That's where Jesus reigns, is in heaven. Different degrees, I don't know what all that stuff is. Paul, never married, never did the temple ordinances, never married, as the Mormons now. He turned the world upside down for Christ. That man I love. When I read uh, Acts chapter 9, wow, this is me. That was my road to Damascus. Paul, what a brother. And I want to be where he's at. He never married, never did the temple ordinances, never did all that stuff. But I know that man's with Jesus. I know it. And so that's heaven. And, and my wife Charlotte pointed out to me, she has just gotten in the Word and she sees stuff different than I do. And I'll come home from work and she says, look what I found today. She said, uh, he that wants to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He who Jesus said this, it's in Matthew, I believe. He wants to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven must be as a small child. Now, if that, the greatest in heaven, if that's not the celestial kingdom, and the only thing he had to do was accept Jesus, be humble as a little child, that's where you're going to be. It's that simple, the simplicity of the gospel. Is, it is amazing. It's just, every time I think about it, I'm blown away. Every time I think about it, I'm overwhelmed with thankfulness. So amazing. And I'll tell you, that's the thing with... with there's something special about a Mormon who comes out because they got this onus, this burden, this mountain that they've carried with them their whole life to be good, to be perfect, to be righteous enough. Did I fulfill all the laws and the covenants and the commandments? Did I do everything I needed to do? And when you're set free, it is such a freedom and such a joy. That's the amazing thing. And I, I you know, I was there was a time when I got bitter and I was like, man, I was duped and I was just angry. And I was like, dear God, I've wasted my life over a lie, over a lie. And I heard the Spirit of the Lord say to me, Adam, I love the Mormon people. I'm like, wow, that's the heart I want. I want to have love. I want to be filled with what Christ has for us. And yet, and that we were still sinners, he went and died for us on the cross. Not, not becoming perfect enough. While we were in our sins, he died for us. How amazing is that? Okay, let me get some scriptures. Because the word is so powerful to me, um, I want to share the word. Please. Okay. By all means. <laughs> um, I, I started in my, this is, this is my, I, I love the Old Testament. I I've seen a little bit of use, uh, yeah. This is, this, I would sleep with it right here in my bunk, and I would read it all the time. Everybody saw me with my Bible, but I started to go through it, and it's like, there's no scripture you really want to leave out. How, what do I, sh what do I share? So I've, I've had to distill it down, and it's taken me some work, but, uh, I believe that God has preserved His Word in the Bible as He promised. And we can go to Matthew 24, 35, and He says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And that's also in Isaiah 48. I believe that His Word is truth and that it will sanctify you. And you can go to John 17, 17. It says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. I believe that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. So then faith come, cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I believe that God will effectually work His work within you as you study His Word. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when ye received the Word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth the Word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And I believe that the word is powerful. Hebrews 4.12 
For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the word. That's just amazing. I believe that we must be governed by the word of God, that God's word takes precedence over the feelings and emotions of your heart. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Acts 17, 11. These were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And then Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. I believe what the Bible says about God, that there is only one God who is eternal and self-existent, who created all things. Isaiah 43.10 and 11, You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe and understand that I am He. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Isaiah 44, 6 and 8. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last and beside me there is no God. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Yea, even ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. He knows not any. So where's the grand counsel of the gods? Um, go to Isaiah 45, 5 and 6. Isaiah 45, 22, Psalms 96, 5, Deuteronomy 4, 35, Psalms 103, Isaiah 44, 24, Psalms 90, verse 20. You can look those up and it, it tells that God is God and the only God. I believe Jesus is God. And that was a hard one for me. That one was, that came by degrees. Um, the whole idea of the Trinity, I fully believe it, but it's that, that was one that came later. In John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Colossians 1, 15 through 19. Now this is speaking about Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by, all, by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Colossians 2, 9 and 10. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. 1 Timothy 6, 16. Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. I believe that we are all under sin, 
that we are all guilty before God and that the law cannot justify us before God. Romans 3, 9 through 23, and I'm just going to hit some of the highlights, but you can go and read it yourself. Romans is so powerful. <laughs> Romans, I just, I have uh, an MP3 player that I just put it on over and over just to listen to it, to try to get the full, you, you just, you can't get to the bottom of it. It's just, uh, Romans 3, 9 through 23. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. In, chapter, in verse 12, it says, There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And verse 19, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. We're all guilty. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. And then in verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I believe that Jesus died for us on the cross and rose again, that he not only paid the price for our sins, but, through, but, but that through belief in his sacrifice, we are made righteous before God. That our salvation is a free gift offered to us by God. It is God's grace that we can receive through belief and faith on his name. It's that simple. That our salvation cannot be obtained by works. Romans 3, 24 through 28. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Romans 4, 1 through 5, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. His faith. Romans 4, 13 through 16. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And down on 16, therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. Romans 5, 1, Romans 6, 16, or 6, 14. Romans 10, 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. How simple is that? Romans 11, 6, and if by grace then it is no more, and if it is by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace, but if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. In Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That was just like a dagger in my heart. I believe that we must believe in Jesus. We believe in him and in all that he did for us and that he will give us eternal life in heaven that we will dwell with him forever. It's that simple. John 3, 5, uh, 15 through 18. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The first time I ever saw that, the first time I ever heard about it, was in a prison watching a football game. 
and a guy was holding up the sign, John 3.16. And I thought, well, what the heck is that? I went and read it, and I thought, wow, that's a nice scripture, but I didn't know the full <laughs> import of what, of what it was. And now it's like, yeah, well, that's the crux of our whole belief. Um, read John 6, verse 40. John 6, verse 47. And, and 647 is simple. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I mean, that's it. But what really, really, the chap, chapter 6 of John is so amazing to me. It's, to me, is the, our religion is the person of Jesus Christ. And in John chapter 6, Jesus said, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, he didn't mean that physically, but he meant it that we have to partake of him. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. By me, him. He said, I am the door. This, this is the gospel. Jesus is the beginning, the end, the answer. He is everything. Um, all the works, all the, the ordinances, the covenances, all these things, they're all, they're done away with. When Jesus was crucified, he ripped the veil of the temple from top to bottom. And that ripping, he opened it up, that through that, that represented his flesh. Through his broken flesh, through his blood, as we believe on him, we have access into the Holy of Holies to God. And that's the gospel. Any other doctrine taught besides the one taught in the Bible will bring a curse upon you and will not save you. Go to 2 Corinthians 11, 3 through 4. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For, he, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, this is Paul talking, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen through 15 For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And then over in Galatians 1, 6 through 9, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. I better repeat this one. Uh, Romans 10, 8 through 13. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Philippians 3, 7-11 through But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, 
and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Can you comment on being born again? A lot of Mormons so misunderstand what that is, and you're so confident that you are. Can you say why? Well, I have confessed with my mouth, and I have believed in my heart that Jesus is the Christ. That's it. It's that simple. I don't have to go on my knees. Uh, I don't have to fast. I don't have to do ordinances. Christ said, come unto me. And all those who come unto me, I will no wise turn away. That is being born again. I am a new creature. He is living his life within me. I partake of him daily. I drink his blood. I eat his flesh. Jesus is everything to me. And I've been born in him. What is it that you love about Jesus you discovered there? What is it about him that just draws your heart? Well, what, what I love about Jesus is every, every attribute, every absolute thing about him. Um, knowing that the God of the universe who created existence, just existence, the space between you and me, that he... He made us, He created us, and here we are. Because He gave us free will, which is the ability to choose, He had to do that. He had to give us that ability to choose. And because there's no true love without choice. If you don't have choice, you really can't love. Communists tried it, it failed. And doing that, he, he knew we would sin and we would fall. And God being a holy God, in Revelations, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Wow! He's holy. He's perfectly holy. And to think that we could work our way back to His presence through our mere efforts. Uh -uh, we couldn't do it. So God Himself took himself, took upon himself flesh and came down and subjected himself to the cross. So we could dwell with him again. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent, all we had to do is lift our eyes up to Christ and say, I believe. That's all he wanted. It's that simple. But it isn't simple. It's deeper than we, we can't ever wrap our minds totally around it. But that's the love that Christ has for us, that God has for us. That's why I'm doing this. Because he, he reached down in this, my old sinful life and my pride, and loved me. And that... Uh, I just want to proclaim it.